Well, again, good afternoon, everyone, and greetings. Welcome, Sabbath services. Uh, great to have you all here and see all of you. And we've got a, a few online, so thank you for tuning in. Hope that you are enjoying it and all the new things we're bringing to you. PowerPoints and uh, just all of it. It's great. What we want to do um, is I want to talk a little bit about some of the problems and the trials that people go through and see if we can't learn a lesson. <laughs> if you want, I don't really have a title. Chuck will come up with a title, I guess. I never do. Chuck, Chuck's really good at coming up with kind of some catchy titles, so that's his department. So after he listens, and he can conclude what the title will be. So, now we know that certainly the Bible does tell us very plainly over and over in numerous places. Um, if you want to look for one, let's go to Psalm 34. Let's go to Psalm 34. Start us off. Book of Psalm. Psalm 34. We'll see something here that David is repeating here. He starts off Psalm 34, verse 1. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. And jumping down to verse 4, he says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. Verse 6, this poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of his troubles. And jumping down to verse 17, says, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles, their problems, their trials. Verse 18, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. You know, we, uh, we read over in Isaiah 57, just don't turn there, just to, just to mention. That's the one, the man of, to whom God will, will look, he that is of a broken and contrite spirit. We even sing a hymn that has those in there. It says, you know, for a broken spirit is to God a sacrifice. Now, Votus, uh, verse 19, to finish off these scriptures here in Psalm, it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now, we might say many are the afflictions or problems or troubles of all mankind. And certainly the church of God, we know we will go through certain tribulations or trials because of the beliefs that we believe. Jesus said, you know, if you were, uh, if you were of the world, the world would love you. But it's because you're not of the world, and I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world will hate you. So we know we can expect that we will have problems living the Christian life in obedience to God, because all of the world has gone the other way, right? Remember, Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. You will have trials. You will have problems. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And what he is saying is, so you can, you can overcome the world. Because, you know, I will make it possible, he said. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. So don't let your hearts be afraid. Don't let them be troubled. He went on to say, You believe in God, believe also in me. And God will take care of you. We'll read more on those scriptures at a later date and time. <laughs> but let's look as we go over. Let's go to the book of Acts. Let's go to the book of Acts, 14th chapter of Acts. I figured out how to uh, highlight in the Bible app, so I have them both up. I have the New King James Version, and I have the Message Version. And you know how the Message Version never puts the Scriptures in? Like one every five pages, it seems like. So I, could, I figured out how to highlight that so I didn't have to search for it too bad. So I'm kind of proud of myself again. <laughs> Technology. Anyway, we'll see something here in Acts 14. Here we find, reading along in verse 22, this is, of course, where Paul has been stoned, dragged out of the city, and they thought he was dead in, in, in verse 19. Picking it up in verse 20, though, it says, so Acts 14, verse 20, When the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and went into the city. And the next day he departed. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, uh, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting, exhorting, them, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must, through many tribulations, many trials, many problems, many tests, enter the kingdom of God. 
So now I do want to read these from the message version. It says, after proclaiming the message um, and establishing a strong core of, of disciples, they retrace their steps, putting muscle and sinew in the lives of the disciples, urging them to stick with what they had begun to believe and not quit, making it clear to them that it wouldn't be easy. Anyone signing up for the kingdom of God has to go through plenty of hard times. So see scripture, as we know, we've read these, we've read these before. We know that hard times come. And so the old saying, you know, you won't go sailing along just on a breeze into the kingdom of God. Jesus said how difficult it will be for those to enter the kingdom of God, especially those who trust in riches. And he said, narrow is the way that leads to life, but few find that. Narrow is the way that leads to and then just the opposite, broad, is the way that leads to destruction, and many go therein. So he said it's through tribulations and trials we'll enter God's kingdom. Let's go to 2 Timothy, the third chapter. 2 Timothy, the third chapter. He's kind of referring to some of what we had just gotten through saying here in the book of Acts, that through the tribulations they would enter the kingdom. And here we find in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to begin in verse 10. It says, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, all of those good characteristics, but also some of the problems that came, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch and the others, just as he had gotten through traveling through, as we read the, the cities that we read there in Acts 14. What persecutions I endured endured and out of them all the lord delivered me they thought he was dead when they when they beat him and drug him out of the city and he got up and he went on but he said that out of all those trials the lord delivered me yes and all who desire to live godly in christ jesus will suffer persecution but evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse deceiving and being deceived but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. And then he explained how that the Scriptures were God-breathed and profitable for us, so that we could be equipped for every good work. Now I do want to read these from the Message Version. It's kind of the same, very similar here. It says, You've been a good pay, uh, apprentice to me, a part of my teaching, my manner of life, direction, faith, steadiness, love, patience, troubles, suffering, suffering along with me in all the grief I had to put up with in those cities that I can't say. And you also well know that God rescued me. Anyone who wants to live all out for Christ is in for a lot of trouble. There's no getting around it. Unscrupulous con men will continue to exploit the faith. They're as deceived as the people that they lead astray. As long as they are out there, things can only get worse. But don't let it phase you. Stick with what you learned and believed. Sure of the integrity of your teachers. Why? You took in the sacred scriptures with your mother's milk. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. It's pretty encouraging. Pretty encouraging words that we read. Now problem, if you look in Webster's Dictionary, dictionary merely means it's a departure from the norm. A departure from peace, from comfort, from happiness, tranquility, all the things that we desire. When that is interrupted and we don't have that peace, our lives are interrupted and we don't have the joy and the happiness that we would love and desire, then we've got a problem. When things don't go the way that they should, then we've got a problem. And those problems, of course, can come from all sources in our lives. Let's talk about physical problems. Physical problem is, of course, when we're not well, you know, the knee is hurting, <laughs> the back is hurting. We can go on and on and name all kinds of physical problems, physical ailments that we might have, and we have to deal with those. Those are problems, aren't they? We have to realize that God has promised to not leave us nor forsake us in those problems, of those, and we're going to go over, go over a couple others. He does tell us that we can call for the elders of the church and be anointed. 
he tells us that we can, you know, that we are, there are certain things that we can do to take care of our needs. And certainly those physical problems, we want them to go away by just that quick fix or that quick pill. Seems like that's, you know, mainstream society, the quick fix. We don't want to go through a problem and learn from it. We're very set in our ways as humans. We don't like learning things, but I hope that we do. So many times we think, well, boy, you know, take this or take that miracle pill and all of a sudden, presto, change you know, our problems are gone and we're all happy and go lucky again. Uh, usually, as a rule, if you read the fine print, there are so many side effects to those quick fix pills, you know, that they put out there. It's not like every day, new pill for this, new pill for that. And then you, can, you begin to realize on those side effects, you know, like, hey, wait a minute, you know, this is going to cause me more problems than I've already got. Um, but the same goes spiritually. The same goes spiritually. So what God is saying is be patient. Wait upon God. Trust in God. He'll bring out the healing and the deliverance in his time and in his way. That's just one example of problems and troubles that we go through, the physical part of it. I've often thought, too, as I've been with Chuck, as he has done many of uh, anointings, been a part of that, that there are two things that God does not promise in the way of physical healing and removal of pain or sickness and disease or whatever it might be. Two things he hasn't told us are how and when. Those are God's prerogatives. He doesn't tell us how or when, but we know that he does work in a miraculous way, and he does care for us. We've seen and we have heard all kinds of cases, you know, where x-rays were taken and it showed a mass, you know, in the lung or the liver or the kidney or whatever it may have been, you know, the problem may have been. And they were prayed for, they were anointed for, and they went back and they took another x-ray and it's gone, you know, and the people are amazed. That How can this be? Those can really be serious problems, too, in, a, in, the, in, the, in the departure from the norm for us in the physical. physical. What about the, the mental, emotional makeup? You know? A lot of people go around worrying, kind of like Job did, you know, that which I feared has come upon me. So another area of trouble, mental, emotional. We fear this or that or the other thing, you know, worry about this or that. And Jesus said, take... No anxious or troubled thought about tomorrow, what you're going to be putting on or eating or drinking. God will take care of the need. And so we can trust God for even helping us in our mental, emotional makeup as well. When we cry out to him and, and, and we ask him for the mind that is in Christ, let this mind be in you which was in Christ. We read that in Philippians 2 verse 5. And so we can go to God when we have a problem with mental, emotional disturbances as well. So physical stuff we can go. Mental, emotional stuff we can go. And, you know, those areas of trouble. You know, we read, you know, there are many who, who worry about every little thing and they make a major problem out of that. Many times, you know, it would have been a minor problem. But by the worrying, just worrying and the frustration, over-anxious and not going to God with it and not learning from it. You know, I've seen mental illness firsthand. You know, I'm not going to go into details and explain it, but I, I, I seen Satan at his, at his height a few weeks ago. Men, you know, the mental illness it, it, it is a very troublesome thing for some people. It's, it's scary out there to those that actually have to deal with that. And it's, it's more widespread than, than, than we think, that mental illness. So see the problems like that that pop up in people's lives. What about financial? It's just, everybody here got all the money that they want? Could ever use in abundance and you're ready to go, you know, give some of it away? Probably not. Probably not. We have financial problems. Another area of problems that we face that come upon us. We do some unwise purchasing or too much credit spending and all kinds of problems can come as a result of that. Now, this is not a sermon on financial planning. I, I am in no, no way able to tell anybody that. It's just one of the sources of the problems that we face. Problems can come through financial mismanagement. And as you know, it's getting harder and harder to make the dollar stretch further than it's already stretching. The old saying, I've stretched George out, I've stretched George out till I don't even recognize him anymore. You know, trying to pinch pennies and do this or that because we have problems. Trying to make especially on a fixed income. You know, I can't imagine, you know, it, it's Probably a long time for the first of the month to the first of the month for some, you know. 
the cost of living is going up and up and up, you know, three, four percent every time. But the paychecks are only going up half that, you know, those, those, those checks. And it's hard, you know, they don't reflect that. So it's hard to make that dollar stretch every time. There's another old saying, the hurrier we go, the behinder we get. <laughs> Many times in financial planning, you know. But here again, God will see us through those types of problems. And I know it's hard. I know it's, it's hard. It's hard to wonder where the income's coming from and to put that faith and put that trust in God. But we've heard it. No matter how, how long you've been in the church, to put your trust and your cares and your hopes and your worries in, in, in God. Go to Him with those. What about marital problems? There's another area. Do we have any areas of marital problems? Absolutely. The divorce rate is higher and higher all the time, and you won't see it coming down. If you do see it coming down, do you know the reason for that? Well, people just aren't getting married anymore. <laughs> they just do what they call live-in nowadays it's better just to live with the person and not get married any you know you know we'll just if that doesn't work then we don't have to divorce we don't have to you know worry about who has what and where and taking what and so you know we'll just find living in and that of course is certainly contrary to God's rules and God's laws but it's a source of problems marital problems you know of all kinds so that you know that area is one of life's certainty, you know, that can cause problems for us. What about spiritual problems? You ever think about spiritual problems? You ever think about that as being a problem? Do we have spiritual problems? Why, absolutely. Too many times we feel God isn't listening, plain and simple. Or too many times we think God isn't doing things how we want him to do it. This is where our own, you know, ourselves get in the way here. You know that God is way off somewhere. God is not watching. And so we can get distraught in our spiritual life and let down, you know, on our spiritual life. We tend to make God really, really small, don't we, When sometimes when we have problems and we forget that, you know, that God made us. That God made us. So there isn't any problem that we will ever face that God won't be there to help us through. And sometimes... I think in our minds, maybe we think that God can't help us through a problem. Our, our trials. We tend to put God on the shelf or we make him smaller. Or we, we, we limit and we don't trust him like we should. And as we well know, there is no better way to begin to solve problems spiritually than to get back on your knees. Get back to studying the word of God. Drinking in of his word and his truth and not trying to solve the problems ourselves. <laughs> Woo! Man, do we mess that up every time. Every time. I mean, just think about it when we sin, knowingly sin. You know, we've talked about how it should strike us, right? It, it should make it bring us to our knees with the guilt that we feel when we sin. And, we, and you know, we catch that. And we should go to God. But how many times do we catch ourselves sinning and think, ah, well, I'll just fix it myself. You know, I'll come up with my own way or whatever. And how many times does that fail? I'm going to say every single time. Because it's true. We can't fix things ourselves. We need God. And then there are all, all other kinds of sources of problems. We're not going to talk about every single problem there is. But there's all sorts of problems. There are accidents. There are things that happen to us that are beyond our control. Accidents do happen. What about the weather? You know, it can cause all kinds of problems. It can rain when it shouldn't rain and the you know farmer's crops are destroyed or, you know, the roof's leaking in or something, you know. It can rain, um, it can rain when it, uh, well, I already read that, certainly, uh, and when there's no rain, it's a drought and that causes problems. And many areas of the world are drought stricken. You know, you look at tornadoes, you look at earthquakes, you look at hurricanes that, 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 that people deal with. All around we see problems, don't we? We see those problems. But where do they come from? Where do all these problems that we just gotten through mentioning, the physical, the financial, the marital, the spiritual, whatever they may be, where do they come from? Well, they come from a couple basic sources. The first source is we cause them ourselves. We just do dumb things many times. Dumb mistakes, crazy decisions that we make, 
and we suffer as a result of it. That's why we need, certainly, to trust God to guide us in making decisions. We, as humans, do a quick fix through a pill, or, you know, there's a quick fix financially through credit cards. We just plop down the credit card, and the first thing you know, you know, the outgo exceeds the income, and we've got a problem. And so we do create problems ourselves. Secondly, they come from others. So if we're creating problems ourselves, well, there's other people that are creating problems too. Others who do things that hurt or harm us. They come from things that others do, faults of others. Others, you know, make a mistake. And then there's also wrong circumstances. You know, we happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time when something happens. Let's notice something here in the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's turn there. The phrase time and chance. Well, let's look at, at time and chance and see just how it sometimes can, can come into play. The ninth chapter. The ninth chapter, we'll notice something here as we read Ecclesiastes 9, in, beginning in, Ecclesiastes 9, beginning in verse 9. You know, we were talking about marital problems a moment ago, but let's look at what God says here. He says, Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your, of your vain or fleeting life, which she has given you under the sun, all your days of vanity, for that is your portion in life, and in the labor which you perform under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So it's just some basic down-to-earth instruction and wisdom and guidance for us. Do things with all of your might. Live life, marriage, work, spiritual living, and follow God, and on and on I could go. And do it with your whole heart. Now notice verse 11, I returned and saw under, this, under the sun that now, here's what you know Solomon observed as he looked around, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. In other words, you think, well, man, oh man, you know, I can't understand how that happened. You know, I, it, it would appear that he would have, you know, been the one to win the battle because he was the strongest, but, you know, not necessarily. But time and chance happen to them all. For man also does not know his time, like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare. So the sons of men are snared in the evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. This is how the message version reads. Relish life with the spouse you love, each and every day of your pre uh, precarious life. Each day is God's gift. It's all you get in exchange for the hard work of staying alive. Make the most of each one. Whatever turns up, grab it and do it. I'm talking joys, it's talking troubles there. And heartily. So, ah, we, just, we just mentioned that. This is your last and only chance at it. For there's neither work to do nor thoughts to think in the company of the dead, where you're most certainly headed. I took another walk around the neighborhood and realized that on this earth as it is, the race is not always to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor satisfaction to the wise, nor riches to the smart, nor grace to the learned. Sooner or later, bad luck hits us all. No one can predict misfortune, like fish caught in a cruel net or birds in a trap. So men and women are caught by accidents, evil, and sudden. Now what's he talking about? He's talking about what Jesus used as an example over in the book of Luke. So let's go to Luke. Luke 13. I should not have used green highlighter. Because now when I read that and I look back, I, I can't see on the white pages. <laughs> Lesson, don't use green highlighter. Okay. If you look over in the book of Luke, 13th chapter, we'll see what Jesus said here in Luke 13 about how problems can happen and it can come. Not necessarily because of some mistake. Luke 13, beginning in verse 1. 
It says there was present at that season some who told him about the Gal uh, Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Now I'm sure they thought you know that Jesus was going to immediately say, Ah, dirty, rotten sinners. They got what they had you know, coming to them. But no. Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these uh, Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? God just reached down and, you know, zapped them because they were the worst sinners found in Galilee? No. He says, no, I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You know, or those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were the worst sinners than any other men who dealt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you repent, you will all likewise perish. So what Jesus is saying is they just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And Pilate mixed the blood of some of the Galileans in their sacrifices. They just happened to be standing in the wrong place when the tower fell on them and killed 18 of them. It wasn't a mistake they made. It wasn't a mistake of the tower. All of a sudden, you know, the laws of gravity just gave way and it came down and killed them. It was just time and chance. They happened to be there. Sometimes we think, well, you know, why did that happen? Just look at all the things that have happened throughout history. 9-11. Why did that happen? You know, all, pick them. Pick <laughs> Put up the calendar and throw a dart and you'll hit something that's happened in life and you can ask, why did it happen? Now, it doesn't mean, you know, that God has, was afar off, you know. Time and chance comes into play. It didn't mean that God has gone off and forsaken us and doesn't know and he, that he won't protect us. That's not it at all. There are just things that do happen. Accidents do happen that we sometimes have no control over. It's kind of like Murphy's Law. You've heard of Murphy's Law. Sure you have. <laughs> there are all kinds of Murphy's Laws, this and that and the other thing. No matter how many times you cut the rope, it's still too short, you know. Well, Murphy's Law says when anything can go wrong, it will. And there's another law that is a cousin to Murphy's Law that says when anything goes wrong, anything you do to it makes it worse. And that's the way it seems sometimes in our course of events is our own human beings. Remember us trying to fix things? <laughs> we fall into that category in our own lives, right? Look at problems we have been through and we've, you know, made it worse because we've tried things our own. Something goes wrong, we try to do something with it, and lo and behold, it gets worse. So what do we do with our problems? Do we pour them on somebody else? And upset their day and upset the apple cart, so to speak, by just telling people all about our problems? No. You talk to God about them. Now, I know we have friends and we have things. It's nice to be able to talk to somebody about our things and, you know, work through problems that we have. That, that, that's, that's, that's absolutely fine. We need that interaction with, with, with family and those that we trust here. But it's also very, very important to take all those to God to talk to him about our troubles and our pains and our and our trials. So I got a story, story time. There was a plumber hired to do some work for this particular fellow, and he said he hired the man to do some repair work on his farm home. He said he had a terrible day. His old truck had a flat on it that cost him an hour of work. He also got ready to go, and he couldn't get the old dilapidated pickup truck started. So the man said, I'll take you home. So he takes the man home, and the man said, Come in and meet my family. I've got a wife and two children. So he said, I got out, and I walked up to the house. Before the man went into the house, there was a tree there at the side of the house, and he reached over, and he caught hold of the tree for a moment, and then went into the house. When he stepped into the house, immediately his face was transfigured from just how downcast look, all, you know, the downcast look that he had all the way home. It now turned into a smile. He picked up his children, gave them a big hug, kissed his wife, and they had a good little chit-chat, and he introduced them to the family. As he went out to return home, he went by this same tree, the plumber, walked him out to the car, and he said, You know, I noticed that you reached over and you grabbed hold of that tree. I'm curious, what was that for? What did that represent, he said. Well, he said, that's what I call my trouble tree when I come home. I know my problems don't belong in the house with my wife and my children, so I reach over and I just give them on the tree. The next morning when I go to work, I reach over and I pick them up again and I take them with me. You know, he said, what's so interesting? 
The next morning, <laughs> there are not as many problems there on that tree as I left there the evening before. He left them where they belonged. He left them on God's shoulder, so to speak. And he didn't take them in to his wife and his children. And so happiness is a choice, is where we're getting to. Not just some random thing that falls upon us. We have to choose how we will handle our problems. And I know it's hard. Some problems, a breeze, easy to get over. Other problems, not so easy. We've all been there. We can all think about it. can all probably rate <laughs> problems that we've gone through. So happiness is a choice. There are so many of those, you know, um, there are so many problems that do crop up in our lives from time to time. That happiness and how we deal with them is a choice. Let's take a look at scripture here. Let's go to Romans. It wouldn't be a sermon if we didn't go to Romans. Romans, in particular chapter, chapter 8. Because this verse is quoted many times, many times it will be misused or misapplied, but yet it means exactly what it says, and it will help us in profiting from our problems. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So we can go to God with our problems. We can cast our cares upon Him. And He tells us to, because He cares for us. So then notice in verse 28, And we know now, knowing doesn't mean just wishful thinking. We wishfully think, or just kind of have a positive mental attitude, thinking, Oh yeah, everything in every way is getting better and better. <laughs> When many times it's not. He says, we know. That is, we know because God has promised, God has assured us, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Or as the Living Trans Translation has it, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God's law and are called according to His purpose. So we might as well read the message version here. It says, Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside, helping us along. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our word, wordless sighs, our aching groans. He knows us far better than we know ourselves, knows our pregnant condition, and keeps us present before God. That's why we can be so sure that every detail in our lives of love for God is worked into something good. And that is true. God knows everything that we face, everything that we go through. Out of our sighs, out of our groans. So we know that all things don't work together the way we want them to. You know, many times we'll say, oh, well, you know, I can disobey God all I want to misspend my finances, abuse my body, sedate myself with pills, and so on and so on, and never have to suffer the consequences, because you know God will, God will work all things together for good. No. He says he works things together for good to those who love God. Did we hope we didn't skip that. It's kind of hidden in there. To those that love God. Again, there's an action on our part. There's a thing, there's something that we have to do. to those who love God, to the called ones according to His purpose and His plan. And so it's not that things are going to work out the way we want them to. They'll work out the way God wants them to for our good so that we learn lessons from it. We have to be learning from everything that we go through. Everything. And so you know all the things involved with problems, of course, means we have to learn a lesson from it. We all face the problems we're all going to face them, but I hope we all learn from all the problems that we go through, from the small ones to the big ones. Learning. If we can learn a lesson from it, then we can chart our course in a better way. We can change the direction when things come around again. 
there was a famous Spanish poet. I can't even say his name. His first name was George. I can say his first name, but I can't. He, he is the one who actually coined the phrase, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So if we don't learn from our problems, whatever they may be, the physical, the financial, all the ones we covered, marital, spiritual, or whatever, if we don't learn from them and ask ourselves the question, what's the cause of this? What caused it? Am I responsible for it? Will I take ownership of it? What will be the result of it? Can I really endure and hold up under whatever God might have me face down the road? If you caught that, that is the core issue. That is the cause, the ownership, the result, and the endurance that we learn from our problems. And so you ask yourself those questions, what caused this? Mr. Armstrong used to always say, for every effect or every result, there has to be a cause. There is a cause. It's a matter of cause and effect. And so we ask ourselves the question, what caused it? Another story. You know, certainly, you know, we hope, you know, we ask ourselves that question to figure it out, you know, and, and help us to endure and to bear, you know, our, 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 our troubles and, and the trials that we do face. So another story. Did you hear about the man whose lawnmower quit running? It's not a joke, it's a story. He couldn't get the lawnmower to start and the grass got taller. The man wouldn't do anything about it and the wife told him, you need to get that lawnmower repaired. And yet it went unrepaired. So to try to stir him into action one day when he came home from work, she was sitting out in the, gra in the tall grass, snipping the grass with a little pair of, of, of sewing scissors. She thought, now surely he'll get the point. He watched a little bit, walked into the house, and came back out and handed her a toothbrush and said, Now when you get through cutting the grass, maybe you'd want to brush off the sidewalk at the same time. The end result is they think he might survive. They think he might survive. But it'll be a while before you know the cast and stuff come off. <laughs> that was pushing it to the limit and trying to be stirred into action to solve a problem. So just a little cute, little funny, little funny story. Now a little... Let's look over at one of my one of my favorite scriptures over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I love this promise that God gives us because with all the problems that are in the world and that come upon us, we have to realize God has promised us something here in 1 Corinthians 10. It has a couple of real good points that he makes and then he tells us gives us a promise. This whole 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians is really an amazing presentation by Paul to those Jews who, of course, were not learning the lesson that they should have learned from their forebears and forefathers. And he says, 1 Corinthians 10, beginning of verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now if you'll notice, if you take this apart one by one, you'll find five blessings here that Paul is reminding his fellow Israelites, fellow Jews who were there. First off, they were under the cloud. They were under the cloud by day and the fire by night, which of course was to direct them in the way that they should go. And they could follow the cloud by day and the fire by night, and they would have God's blessing. They all passed through the sea. The sea opened up and all the Israelites, all the Israels, you know, all Israel went through. And then the Egyptians thought, you know, well, maybe we can make it through and catch them, you know, and yet, and, and return them to the land. And as you know, the waters came through and, and drowned, and drowned them. Now it says they were baptized into, they all passed through the sea and were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. It says they ate the same spiritual food. Now, Paul is trying to tell them, that's exactly what I've been doing for you here in Corinth. I've been showing that God will guide you, just like he did the Israelites with the cloud and through the Red Sea and through the, the, the troubles and their trials and their problems. And now I've been giving you the spiritual food that you need, just as God gave them spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink, and they, and they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. So this is an identifying sign that the God of the Old Testament was Jesus Christ, who was right there with them. 
Verses, verse 5 now, But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things came, uh, these things became our examples. Now wait a minute. We're going to talk about solving problems now. Learning the profit, you know, learning to profit from our problems. He said, These things became our examples. To the intent that they should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual morality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Do you know why they were killed by serpents? Because they began to accuse Moses. You don't know the way to go. You don't know the way to the promised land. We'll, you know, we'll take off on our own direction. And God sent scorpions among them, and, and Moses had to raise up serpents in the wilderness, and, they, and the plague was stayed. And he said in verse 10, Nor murmur, as some of them were murmurers, because they didn't have any food or any water. They said, you know, oh, we're thirsty. And God gave them water. Oh, we're hungry, and God gave them manna. Oh, we'd like some meat, and he gave them, a, a, I mean, up to their nostrils, you know, as you all well remember. And because they murmured, they were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11, he repeats again, just as he had down in verse 6, what do we learn from all of this? Why did he give them this short discourse in history? Now, all these things happened to them as examples, but the examples were written down for our admonition. For those who are in, in the ends of the age, those of us upon whom the ends of the ages have come, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Now, what do you say? You know, he is saying very plainly Israel had problems. They didn't deal with their problems. They didn't learn from their problems. They didn't follow the cloud by day. They went through the Red Sea, but then they began to mumble and grumble and forget about God and the miraculous plagues, the deliverances, the firstborn through the Red Sea, and on and on and on their way to the promised land, and they didn't learn from those. He said, that's what happened with us. We have been called out of this world. We've gone through our Red Sea in baptism. We have been resurrected to a new life. And now we are to go forward, following and remembering these examples, so we don't murmur, we don't complain, we don't commit idolatry, as they did and they fought and fall. And he said, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. I want to read verses 11 through 18 from the message version. Here we go with the green highlighter again. It says, these are all warning markers, danger, in our history books, written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They at the beginning, we at the end. And we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You're not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. So, my dear, my, my very dear friends, when you see people reducing God to something that they can use or control, get out of their company as fast as you can. I assume I'm addressing believers now who are mature. Draw your own conclusions. When we drink the cup of blessing, aren't we taking into ourselves the blood, the very life of Christ? And isn't the same with the loaf of bread we break and eat? Don't we take into ourselves the body, the very life of Christ? Because there is one loaf, our manyness becomes oneness. Christ doesn't become fragmented in us. Rather, we become unified in him. We don't reduce Christ to what we are. He raises us to what he is. That's basically what happened even in old Israel. Those who ate the sacrifices offered on God's altar 
entered into God's action at the altar. I just love how that puts it out every time. Is it possible for us to fall? Oh, absolutely. It's very possible for us to fall. In fact, it's not difficult at all. All we've got to do is just let up on our faith and confidence in God, on our prayer, on our study, and reliance upon Him to work with us and to be with us in our problems and in our trials. And boom, flat on our face we go every time. Now notice this promise, verse 13, you know, we, we read over it, but this is one of, the, one of my favorite scriptures here in the Bible. It says, no temptation that is, trial or test, has overtaken you, any one of you, myself, any one of us. There is nothing overtaken us except such as is common to man. What he means is problems happen to us all. Problems happen to all of us. Accidents do happen. These all bewildering, nightmarish things happen. Maybe because we caused it. Maybe because somebody else caused it. Or maybe just it's an accident, time and chance. Therefore, he says it is common to man. But here is the key. Here is the key. How do we learn from a problem? God is faithful. God has a purpose. That's why he says he works all things together for good according to his purpose. For those whom he calls according to his will. God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted, tested, or tried beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, the trial, and the problem, the test, whatever it may be, whatever has gone wrong in your life, or maybe going wrong right now, God says he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, on your own strength. No, it's Christ in us. The hope of glory. It's through Christ we can do all things, as Paul said. And he says he will also make the way of escape. That we can avoid it? No! That we can run from it? No! That we can ask God and it will just suddenly disappear and not happen? No! He said that you may be able to bear it. So telling you that you're going to go through it. That's where faith, that's where confidence, that's where reliance, that's where prayer, meditation, trusting God comes into play. Doing our part of our commitment, our pledge to God that we made, our running our race, our being the light of God, to learn from it, to go through it and make us stronger. Because you know, remember, we've got an end goal, the kingdom of God that we're learning that we're growing that we're striving all different stages in our lives here to become better and closer and stronger brighter lights let's look over in matthew the 11th chapter this is where jesus was telling the ones in in that day who were troubled and tossed about to and fro matthew chapter 11 as we work down toward the end of chapter 11 matthew chapter 11 verse 28 he says come to me Come to me, Jesus said, all who labor and are heavy laden. Sure, sometimes the burden gets mighty heavy. That pain gets mighty severe. That disease gets, you know, gets, gets crazier. But he says, come to me if you labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you peace. I will give you the opposite of the problem. That's peace and tranquility and rest and comfort. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. In other words, in the Greek it says to be joined to me be attached to me don't try to do it on your own cry out to god claim his purpose rely on him and be joined in faith to him in faith take my yoke upon you and learn from me don't rely on your own smarts your own ingenuities and planning learn from god learn from me for i am gentle and lowly in heart i can be touched with the feelings of your infirmities because, as he said over in the book of Hebrews, we don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, our, our, our cares, our troubles. We have a high priest who can, can be. Because we all know, remember, that he was in all points tempted, tested, tried, like you and I, yet without failing. And he's been there. He's been through it. He's not proud and arrogant and ready to clobber somebody and beat them over the head or, you know, for maybe a mistake that he made. He said, I'm gentle. I'm not the haughty, you know, dictatorial ruler. Jesus said, I come to serve. I didn't come to be served. I 
came to serve and give my life a ransom for all. I'm gentle and lowly or meek in heart. And he said, and you will find rest for your souls. You might not catch, maybe, maybe you did catch what verse 30 is actually saying in the Greek. For my yoke, or being joined to me, is purposeful. It is useful. Being joined to me, it says, it's easy. That's not really the meaning of the Greek word. The Greek word means being joined to me makes you useful, purposeful, adequate for anything if you're joined with me. Not me. I didn't mean to point at myself. If you're joined with Jesus and God. And he says, my burden is light. My burden has purpose. My burden, my task that I will put upon you has a purpose. It is meaning it has a good end result if we will cast it on him. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Right in line here, what Jesus was saying, 1 Peter chapter 5. Beginning in verse 1, he says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, I also and also a partaker. Now notice, a witness of the sufferings of Christ. He saw what Christ went through for us, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you. You know, our calling as ministers, deacons, elders, the church of God is to shepherd, to tend, to nourish, to comfort and feed. As Jesus said to Peter when he asked him the three times, you know, do you love me? Each time he responded back after Peter said, well, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. He said, then you tend my sheep, feed my flock, take care of them. He said to shepherd the flock of God which is among you. Serving as overseers, not as constraint. In other words, looking after their their good, their welfare, not by constraint or compulsion like, you know, I'm forced to do it, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, not for money, it's, you know, that's involved, not for salary, but eagerly. Nor as being lords or dictators or masters, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders, the mature ones in the learning process. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed in humility. For God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, what did I read all that for? To get to this point. He says there's the way it works. Here's the way it works. You have problems? Yep. You have trials? Yep. You have testings? Yep. You have temptations? Yep. Check them all off. You have something that is bothering you? Yep. <laughs> then he says, verse 7, Casting all your care, all of your anxieties, all of your worries, the Greek word means care, upon him, for he cares for you. And the Greek extends on it. If you will read in the Amplified Bible, which gives you amplification in two or three, sometimes two or three and four extended, you know, magnified meanings of the Greek word. Uh, there in the Amplified Bible is, tra is, um, is translating. Casting all your cares upon him because he carefully, watchfully looks after your best interest. It says, you know, he cares for you. So we can cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. What have we learned from our problems? Don't try to shoulder your problems alone. Like the man who put them on his trouble tree and left them outside and went in to his wife and the children with peace. What a great example to, you know, for us to strive for. How many times do we do that? We just let our problems and our, 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 our trials, our problems, any of it, kind of eat us up and kind of ruin things, I guess, so to speak, when we need to hang them on, on the tree. Kind of symbolic there, isn't it? Just like the man who put them on 
his trouble tree, and he left them outside and went in to his wife and his children with peace. Cast your cares on Christ. Leave them there. He'll give you the way to see through every one of those problems or those trials. Now as we begin to wrap this up, let's go back to uh, the book of James. The book of James is an amazing book. <laughs> if you study the background of the book, and I believe it's in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, they point out 25 examples here used in the book of James, just from different events of nature, like the wind blows where it will, you know, we put bridles into the horses' mouths and steer them where they want to go, we take the rudder of a ship, you know, we make that ship go where we want it to go, but the tongue is a little member that can't be controlled. On and on, James talks about these things out of life, just simple physical things out of life, to teach us spiritual examples. you got to reread James. It's so good. Such a, such a good book. Now here he says, verse 2, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I hope you didn't think I wasn't going to get through a message about trials and troubles without going to this scripture. I had to. I had to. <laughs> but now, wait a minute. That certainly sounds like a contradiction, right? Doesn't it? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials? Doesn't sound very pleasant. The message calls it like this. It says, consider it a sheer gift. It uses the word gift. Consider it a sheer gift, friends, when tests and challenges come to, at you from all sides. You know that under pressure, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. So it's telling you, don't try to get out of it. Go through it so you can see your flaws. <laughs> Learn from it. Let it do its work so you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. Exactly. Go through it so you can see where you're deficient, so you can mature, so you can grow closer to God, so you can learn through the trials and the troubles that we all face and go through. What a beautiful scripture, what a beautiful example to take to heart. So sometimes we think it can't get any worse, right? Yeah, you know, it can get worse. There have been brethren, there have been friends, you know, people that we know that you just think for them, how could it get any worse? Maybe in your own lives, in our own lives, you know, things just pile up. I had that point in my life. It seemed like everything was piling up and coming, boom, 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 and you think, can it get any worse? And then you've all heard the story, boom, I broke my leg trying to trying to be Scotty Pippen down in, uh, down in Lexington. But anyway. Can it get any worse? Will God see us through it? Yes, he will. Absolutely will. What do we learn from it? We learn we can trust God. That he won't put anything on us greater than we can bear. He will help us bear up under the problem, you know. And he'll see us through it because he says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And we can count on that. We can count on that. Finishing James 1, verses 2 and 3, it said, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Another word, the message kind of didn't put that word in there, the word of patience. Do you realize that you will not learn patience unless you have a problem that's going to require patience <laughs> to see it through till it is solved? Until the solution comes, nothing good comes out of the quick fixes. You have to learn the patience and the perseverance to get through the trial, through the problem. Patience is one of those virtues that is a fruit of God's Spirit. Remember those? There's so much to remember. There's so much. If you put it on a big old poster board, you still wouldn't have it. You know? There's so many things to remember. But the fruits of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, for reference, if you to go back and, and revisit Love, joy, peace, patience is in there. That's the fourth one that has to do with our inner relations with other, other people. Patience. Verse 4, but he says, let patience have its perfecting or its maturing effect. I can't even tell you the word in the Greek. I'll, I'll, merge, I'll, I'll, I'll butcher it. 
but it means to mature. It's T-E-L-E-I-O-S. Or perfect, to mature, to grow up and complete, lacking nothing, is what that word means. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But ask in faith, because it is only when we ask in faith that we will receive that which we ask. So we learn patience through all of this too. In conclusion, let's wrap it up in one final book. Wouldn't be a sermon if we didn't go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning in verse 5, it says, Let your conduct, our lives, our day-to-day -day living be without covetedness. That's where problems start coming into play. When we start coveting and lusting and desiring what we don't have or shouldn't have. So be content with such things as you have. Paul over and over said, I have learned whatever condition I am therewith to be content. I've been hungry. I've been full. I've been shipwrecked. I've been warm. I've been cold. I've been through all of the, you know, the, the gamut of physical problems, physical circumstances, and so on. And yet he said, I've learned in all of these to be content with what I have and whatever the condition was. So he said, be content with such things as you have. For, him, for he himself, that's God himself, we can read this, believe this, and rely on it. God himself has said, I will never leave you. Did you realize if you look at the Greek on this too, it has three negatives? He repeats it three times. I will never, no, never, no, never leave you nor forsake you. Did you ever, you ever know that? So cool. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. This is broken into three statements, not just one long statement. Verse 6, the Lord is my helper. You got a problem? Where are you going to find help? God says he's our helper. He's the one that will give us the strength and the wisdom and the direction to go. Knowing that, he says, I will not fear. He said, fear cast out love. There's no fear in love. The perfect love cast out fear. So I'll not fear. I'll not worry about it. I'll not become over anxious about it because he's my helper. He'll be with me and give me the strength and I will fear not. Now the next statement is, what can man do to me? What can man do to me? Jesus said, don't fear him that can destroy your life, take your life. He said, rather you fear God who can destroy body and soul. He's the one we should fear, not man. And so we can say, I will not fear man. And what can he do? He can only take me, my physical life, but not my eternal one. Not the promises that God has made through Christ. And so... And finally, verse 7 and 8, Remember those who guide you, lead you, look after you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So brethren, Jesus Christ, who went with the Israelites and tried to show them in every turn of events their problems and how to get out of their problems, you know, if you read 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, you will find one long historical episode of problems. Problems caused by either a good king who, you know, minimized the, the problems or a bad king who magnified the problems. Over and over it will say such and such was the son and then his son came to reign and he was worse than his father and he was worse than his father and so on and so on. They had problems of all kinds. They didn't learn. Paul said these were written for our examples to learn, to mature, and to grow that we won't do the things that they did. We won't forsake our God. You know, we're coming up that time of season three weeks away, that time where we really reflect on ourselves. We, you know, we always say we should be doing it all the time, but it's amplified around this time of year to really reflect on ourselves, the things that we need to work on. Maybe problems and trials and how we react to them is an area that we need to work on instead of being oh bo hum, you know, humbug is me which is easy to do maybe we 
strive to look at our problems and our trials in a different way that we could profit from them. We can learn from them. We can grow from them. We'll stay faithful to God. We'll trust in Him. And He's the one who will solve those problems for us if we trust Him, if we go to Him, if we stay close to Him. So brethren, what do we learn from our problems? That God is real, His word is true, and that He will always see us through.